note to listeners, the following podcast contains material that may not be appropriate for all audiences. Previously on Father Wants Us Dead. We were selling so many papers in the Westfield area that the trucks would have to be sent out to make second deliveries to the news racks because they were selling out within an hour. I remember that after the first guilty, I turned to look at him and he was like, you know, stone-faced. They did talk to him. I believe my mom point blank asked him why he didn't kill himself. I mean, I think she was a little surprised that he didn't. But I thought it was appropriate that each of the victims had their own sentence and I ran consecutively, so uh, he wasn't going to get out. I'm Jessica Remo. And I'm Rebecca Everett. And this is Father Wants Us Dead, a podcast about the John List murders from NJ.com and the Star Ledger, and a podcast just that's nearing the finish line. Over the last eight episodes, we've watched as John List failed at his career and as a father and husband. And we've gotten to know the List family members and heard about how each one was cruelly snuffed out. And we watched List fake his way through a new life. We've seen his downfall and ultimately his death from pneumonia in 2008. It seems pretty final. But that's not it. The story of the List family members doesn't end there. And it still hasn't ended. Not really. There's still the fear and loss and the ripples felt by those who are still around. But it's also that there's just still so much mystery to this. There are questions that we all want answered because it's still so incomprehensible. Even among other family killings, familicides, the case stands out. Yeah, I mean, familicide is certainly rare, but as we've learned too well in our years of covering crime, it happens. But more often they're murder-suicides or sometimes delusional killers. But the list murders, we can't put it in a box, right Jess? It's not a crime of passion. John List wasn't a serial killer or a psychopath. And he's not so mentally ill that he thinks he's God or something. He just does not fit a crime narrative we've ever heard before. And that's what took me all this time to realize the List case hasn't stuck around in our collective memory for this long just because of the horror or how he managed to get away with it for so long. It's because he's basically in a category all by himself. This crime, there's never been anything like it before or since. And what's more fascinating and visceral than this seemingly average guy committing one of the worst crimes you've ever heard of? And then the reason why is just, it just doesn't make sense. And that's one of the big things we're going to be looking at in this final episode. What really made John List do this? We've heard about his motive, but after all the insight we've gotten into his mind... What do we really believe about his reasoning? And what did he really believe? And we're doing all of this to get to another question. And it's one that might make some people uncomfortable. Is it possible that this man who seems like such a complete monster deserves, maybe, a measure of sympathy? Right. I think it's easier and maybe more comfortable to just call him an evil monster and move on. But... It's a more complicated and human story than that. So let's take it back to Dr. Simring. He's the psychiatrist who interviewed John List for four hours before his trial. I spent a morning with him at his house in North Jersey. We ended up talking for about four hours too. And at one point in our interview, he said something that floored me. He thinks there's maybe a little bit of John List in all of us. He's not even close to a monster, despite the fact that his deeds were monstrous. I don't know how you define monster, but he's not a monster in terms of he's not a sadist or somebody who loves inflicting pain or a Nazi or somebody who uh, uh, wants to kill the whole world. He's just not that kind of person. I mean, John List is not that different from me. I've also raised a family. I've also had financial stress. I've also been angry at my wife and my mother. I've also been angry at my kids. I mean, there are shared human things. The difference is I I, I sort of get get control uh, like almost everybody. And what's so unusual about John List, he didn't. Jess, my thinking has kind of evolved after all are digging into this case. 
I do still think John List is one of the most heartless killers I've ever covered, and I don't have very much sympathy for him. But he was also battling his own brain. He's a guy who approaches the world in a completely different way from the rest of us. True. But I think even if we consider his personality disorder, we can still call him a monster. He committed true evil five times over and never felt bad about it. Fair point. And we'll lean more on experts like Dr. Simmering to figure out these big questions. But first, Jess, we're going to start with some of the smaller questions. Yeah, these are the things that people kept bringing up to us as we did our interviews. Rumors that have just become part of the lore of John List, whether or not there's any truth to them. Like, what happened to the List family's dog? Yeah, Tinkerbell, their Pekingese dog. She was this little barky dog. Everyone who went to their house remembered her and how much Patty loved her. Some people heard that List killed poor Tinkerbell when he killed his family or just left her in the house to die. But when Dr. Simring asked what happened to Tinkerbell, List himself couldn't even remember. All evidence suggests John List didn't off the dog the day he killed his family. Here's part of my conversation with Fred's friend, Rick Bader. About a week or two before the murders, their dog just kind of mysteriously disappeared. Like ran away. Yeah. And the dog didn't run away. It was just, a, it seemed a little bit odd. And looking back on it, well, did he just get rid of the dog? Did it really run away? Who knows? So that's one of our unsolved mysteries. And I wouldn't put it past John List to commit dog murder. But there was also a much bigger mystery the police would have loved to solve. Who burned down the List mansion? About nine months after the murders, in the middle of the night, Freeze Knoll went up in flames. One of the Devlin brothers, Nick, jumped out of bed and snapped a bunch of photos while it was burning. You can see them, published for the first time, on our website. In the days after the fire, police told reporters they thought it was arson. The house had been emptied and all the utilities shut off. So what else could it have been? Everyone we asked about the fire said they assumed it was caused by the teenagers who used to sneak into Breeznoll for kicks. Here's Barney Tracy, the retired Westfield police chief. The list home on Hillside Avenue became like an attractive nuisance. Kids would go up there all the time. They'd have seances, they'd drink, they'd smoke weed or whatever and do their thing. It's my belief that kids were in there. There was a lot of candles. There were still some curtains. And I think that it was just a, an accident, accidental burning. Or kids did it and just got away with it. Either way, authorities never got enough evidence to charge anyone. And what was left of the mansion was raised in September 1972. And there's another rumor about this house that I really wanted to put to bed, Jess. People said that the ballroom had a priceless Tiffany glass skylight. And if List had known about it, it could have saved him from financial ruin. You wanted to disprove it, and I really wanted it to be true. Because it's just the perfect twist to this story that the answers to all John List's problems were right above his head. So you remember Dave Devlin, the neighbor. He says his dad was an architectural historian and was the one who first saw that skylight and recognized its true value. So it had a Tiffany multicolored skylight that was just huge. My dad had said, of course, he was going under. If he had just sold that to somebody, he probably would have made out okay. So the first written mention of this theory was in Righteous Carnage, a book about the List murders that came out after the trial. The person who bought the List property in 1972 told the authors he was sure the ruined skylight was Tiffany and worth probably $100,000 at the time. That's the equivalent of about $700,000 today. The buyer, Kurt Bauer, died in 1996. We asked everyone who'd been in the house about this. We even talked to the great-granddaughter of the wealthy businessman who built it in the 1890s. Everyone had heard the rumor, but no one knew if it was really true. So we went to the Tiffany experts. 
First, I asked Martin Eidelberg, a professor who's written books on Tiffany, if this was even likely or possible. We don't have photos of the skylight itself, but I sent him photos of the exterior of the ballroom, and he pointed out that it's not the kind of truly luxe estate that would be able to afford a giant Tiffany skylight. We do know that the builder, J.S.A. Whitkey, was very rich. But it's true, it's not like this is a Vanderbilt mansion. Which was the exact same point made by our other Tiffany scholar. His name is Paul Doros. He's worked at museums and auction houses like Christie's. He actually grew up not far from Westfield, so he's very familiar with the list story. This room is like this floating around all the time that people have houses with Tiffany in it. And 99 times out of 100, it's not Tiffany. I've been doing this for an awfully long time, and I've learned never to say anything is impossible when it comes to Tiffany, because he did some outlandish, incredible things. But in this case, the odds are very, very small. Doesn't sound like he's buying this, Rebecca. No. First of all, the buyer said he saw the stained glass in the burned mansion, but he didn't buy the property until months after the house was raised. Why would he allow the building to be raised? I mean, he said it was signed, I think, right? He's saying that it was signed Louis Comfort Tiffany. And prior to 1915, the windows were primarily signed Tiffany Studios. So there's a question about that. Second of all, Tiffany made thousands of windows, maybe only 5% of signs. And doing a skylight would be unusual for him to sign because nobody could see the signature. And even if it was a Tiffany skylight... Doro said the estimate of its value is bonkers. The $100,000 number is insane for that time period because Tiffany objects weren't selling for that much. And also a skylight is a really hard thing to sell because of its size. So the market value next to nothing at the time. Okay, well, I guess the best we can do is to say that it is technically possible, but not probable. Yeah, not likely. But still, Jess, it's a great example of how so much of the John List story has become legend. It's been repeated enough times, it seems like an integral part of the story, but really, we don't know for sure. And that's how legends work. People keep embellishing them and adding to them, and even creating their own. It's not surprising an entire cottage industry of pop culture came out of the List murders. I know, right? John List became a pop culture darling. We've talked about The Stepfather, the movie from 1987, when he was still on the run. But after he got caught, there was an explosion of stuff inspired by him. The movie Judgment Day was directly about List, starring Robert Blake, who was later accused of killing his own wife. You can't make this stuff up. And List also helped inspire Kaiser Soze, the hiding-in-plain-sight villain in The Usual Suspects. Right, because the writer, Christopher McCory, and director, Brian Singer, were both from New Jersey. And these movies are still coming out. They remade The Stepfather in 2009 with Penn Badgley. It got terrible reviews. And there was even an indie flick in 2020 called The Killer Next Door. I've got to assume those reviews weren't any better. Besides the movies, there were songs, like the one from the New Jersey band The Whirling Dervishes, called John's List. Clever title there. And there were three true crime books. We mentioned Righteous Carnage, but there was also Death Sentence and Thou Shalt Not Kill. And the TV specials, like American Justice and Forensic Files, they were replayed on TV for years. Again, another testament to how this story has just stayed with people, fascinated us for decades. You can't shake it off. This killer whose way of thinking is just so hard to understand. Hard, but not impossible. After the break, we'll see what light our experts can shed on the inner workings of John List's mind. And whether he ever really believed those reasons he kept repeating. So how could John List do this? By this point, we've been through the straightforward answers. He couldn't stand them being poor and homeless, and his upbringing and personality disorder meant he saw only a few options. 
end, he had to tie up the loose ends. He couldn't just run. So for me, there are a few broader questions we should try to answer here. First, did John List really do this because he believed it was the only way to save his family from ruin and hell? Or was that just an attempt to explain it away? And second, did this happen because of John List's personality disorder? And if so, does that change anything about how we think of him and his brand of evil? Super simple questions, Rebecca. Shouldn't be complicated at all. Oh yeah, only something people have been trying to figure out for 50 years. So let's start with the real why. Many people we talked to, including people who knew List, thought he was basically a coward who wanted a way out and tried to justify himself. But the psychologist and psychiatrist you interviewed, Jess, had different feelings about how John List saw the world and made his decisions. And they didn't agree with each other either. First, we have Dr. Alan Goldstein, who examined List for the defense at trial. He said List acted without malice or evil intent. His intentions were just really, really misguided. It wasn't as if he didn't have a conscience. If anything, his conscience was too great. He felt responsible for saving souls. List said he knew it was wrong, but Goldstein said List felt he was acting righteously. But Simring concluded that List did have some other feelings that went into what he did. He talked about resentments. This was not some wild killer. This was a very controlled man who had very specific reasons and resentments that led him to murder his whole family. Simring said List had some bitter feelings against Helen and Alma. He felt like they were both domineering and wanted this big house he couldn't afford. But Simring said List had only the mildest resentments against his daughter and really didn't have anything against his sons. Right, well, how could he? They were all just innocent kids. Exactly. But he rationalized getting rid of them because they would go to heaven. And when List claimed he shot everyone from behind, Simring thought that was kind of a rationalization too, not an outright lie. So the kinds of misrepresentations were really wishful thinking and rationalization to somehow comport the facts with his moral compass so that he wouldn't feel that bad about it. You know, his family was in a better place. Okay, Jess, here's my take, my verdict, after living in this story for a year. I think List was mostly driven by his desire for a clean slate, not by his need to save his family. But because he was so obsessive and moralistic, he had to rationalize a solution that tied up those loose ends, his family's lives. I mean, it it makes me wonder what would have happened if he wasn't so religious. Could he have rationalized what he did without that piece? Yeah, it's like if he didn't think he was also saving their souls, could he have ever killed them? Okay, now here's my take. I think Liss' major problem was with Helen. She just ran his ego into the ground like Gabe Gluck said. But if he gets rid of Helen, then it's a domino effect. If he kills one of them, he's got to kill all of them. And that's the conclusion he came to after those nights contemplating it all from his recliner. And that's exactly what happened. Right, because as we've talked about, this is a guy who once he gets something stuck in his head, he can't change course. Which takes us to the other big question here. How much of a factor was List's personality disorder? Yeah, I think as humans, we want to blame this on something. So if we can point to a reason and say... Maybe if this person had help, medication, therapy, it wouldn't have happened. And then maybe that helps us sleep at night. He had obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but we know that didn't make him a killer because OCPD is not associated with violence. But you've got to think that having OCPD also probably didn't help. If it wasn't for his rigidity, He wouldn't have thought that he needed to kill his family. He'd just split. And he also wouldn't have had the stomach to actually do what he did. So then, what caused List to have this personality disorder? 
I called Dr. Simmering again to ask him, but he said there's no really satisfying answer here. Well, that's sort of one of the fundamental questions always in almost any psychiatric condition. And that is, is it nature or is it nurture? It's the oldest question in the world that you always look at this and wonder. And this pendulum goes back and forth. There are sometimes that the authorities think it's more nature, sometimes it's more nurture. It is a combination. You really cannot say. That makes sense that it's a bit of both. We talked to so many people who blame this on his upbringing, but he wasn't abused. And not everyone who grows up with strict, proud parents ends up with OCPD and this lack of empathy. Dr. Simmering said that lack of empathy in list, it's a lesser degree of what happens with psychopaths. And I think it's the reason so many people think of List as a psychopath. The experts agree he doesn't meet the clinical criteria. But one I talked to said he wasn't that far off. Dr. Michael Stone is a psychiatry professor at Columbia, and he's been researching all kinds of killers, their crimes, and their motivations for more than 30 years. I have an Excel file of mass murder. Uh huh. That's a fun document. Hey? <laughs> I have about 368 cases in, wow. in my file. You know, the last I looked a couple of days ago. Doctor Stone is famous for coming up with his own scale of evil when it comes to killers. It's basically a scoring method of how bad they are. The lowest numbers are for those who kill impulsively. The middle of the pack are those with some psychopathic traits. And the highest numbers are for the real deal psychopaths like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer. And List is somewhere in the middle? Yep. Dr. Stone considers List to be right below the psychopathic level. He said List's evil stems from egomania and his warped religious views. Now that scenario is a singular. You can't find too many other John Lists. You know, the contrast between the wickedness and the cheerful assumption that what he did was okay and that he's going to end up in heaven with them right. is so striking, so different from what other men, including those committing familicide, right. do, that I think it grabs a lot of attention and understandably so, because right. it's unique. That's so interesting, because besides his coldness, List was pretty much the opposite of other psychopathic traits, like being charming or impulsive or... Always in trouble with the law? He definitely wasn't a charmer. Okay, Jess, I think the only thing left to delve into is the very last excuse List gave as to why he did what he did. Post-traumatic stress disorder. That's how he argued he should get a new trial in 1995. Now, it's definitely possible that List really suffered significantly from PTSD from World War II. But the judge refused the request saying none of the psychiatric experts saw any symptoms of PTSD. In his memoir, List says his only symptom is that he can't remember many events from his 41 days of combat. He does recall the details of the incident that earned him a bronze star. List and a dozen others were taken prisoner by a group of German soldiers. But within a few hours, the tables turned and the Germans surrendered to List and his comrades. It sounds dramatic, but List actually fell asleep and had to be woken up to help translate the negotiations. And we know Dr. Simring certainly didn't buy List's PTSD theory. John List had none of that. None of it. He slept like a baby. He had none of the criteria of PTSD. The mere fact that he served in combat simply meant he could have developed PTSD, but he didn't. So that was a red herring. Okay, well, that's pretty decisive. So where does that leave us on List's mental state? So he's not a psychopath, Rebecca, but he shares some similarities. He wasn't out of touch with reality. He just saw things differently and even felt them differently. And his oddness wasn't so odd, at least not on its face. Remember, Simmering said he never would have predicted that John List would kill his family. We've spent all this time over these episodes trying to understand List better than ever. And I think we've done that. But ultimately, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the devil here, especially when you consider the victims. Absolutely. 
the ones who really deserve sympathy. The List family, Dolores, all the loved ones. We'll hear more about them and examine List's legacy in Westfield after the break. So, Rebecca, you know that back when we started, I couldn't wait to tackle this because I grew up hearing about the John List story. It was legend, and I wanted to see what was really true. But now, after all of our reporting, the things that struck me most were these personal stories that people told us and just the way they told them, like how Barney Tracy got choked up, you know, thinking about a father's love for his kids and then what List did. Right. It stopped feeling like a true crime story. When I met with Chris Day, he just had so many little stories about the time he spent with Patty and what she was like, and it kind of changed things for me. When I go back and listen to our interviews, you just stop being the journalist, and you feel it. So he told me about taking her to a Bee Gees concert in Asbury Park about two months before she died. And he said she really wanted to hear her favorite song, I've Gotta Get a Message to You. And this was before the Bee Gees disco sound. It's kind of a dark song, and there's a line in it. One more hour, and my life will be through. That's right, I know that song. And it is kind of ominous. Yeah, and at first, that's what hit me about it. But I'll be straight with you. I've been listening to that album, Idea, on rotation now for like six months. And I know it's cliched and kind of silly, but it's like, hey, me and Patty List really dig the same album. And I know I'm more than twice the age she was, but I remember what it was like to be a teenager and your strict parents let you go to a concert of a band you love. It makes her feel really real. Yeah, I mean, how can you not identify with her? And it makes it that much more heartbreaking that she had so little time left after that. The List kids had so little time, period. And for all we learned about them, I still feel like we only scratched the surface through their friends' memories. Someone reached out to me the other day and told me John Jr. was 8th grade class treasurer. I never knew that, but it's like he was taking after his dad, the accountant, like trying to make him proud. If that's true, that just breaks your heart even more. With John Jr. and Fred, everyone said they were such good kids. Here's Rhonda Hanson-Conway remembering hanging out with John Jr. He was a sweet kid, had a great smile, great laugh. I don't know, I always felt kind of drawn to him. You know, we'd talk, uh, we'd hang out at the church or at the youth group, but yeah, that's what he was like. And then there's Alma. She uprooted her life to go live with them, to be a good grandma. And when Helen was sick, Alma was there for the kids. And for Helen, maybe a lot of people just remember what was said about her at the trial, not all of it good, but we know she wasn't always this unhappy woman sick in bed. She was that fiery girl from the bowling alley, a party girl who pushed List out of his comfort zone and made him have fun. And she was smart. In the book Death Sentence, Jean Seifert said Helen applied to be on Jeopardy in the 60s and made it past the first screening, but never went through with it. And then you have Patty. Susan Cousins Jankowitz remembered how ecstatic she was to get to understudy the lead in A Streetcar Named Desire, a part she never got to play. And Susan said she wasn't really a wild child. She just wasn't going to let her dad tell her how to live her life. To be honest, I think she just had a strong spirit. And she was kind of like, the hell with it. You know, this is my life, not yours. So when I say rebellion, that's the wrong word. I think she had a little more inner strength and courage and self-confidence to say, you know, I love you, but this is kind of what I want to do. You can hear in her voice how much she loved her friend and that it's still painful. And this was something we had to reckon with, that we were asking people to dredge up this awful, painful thing. But that's the single most enduring impact of List's existence. What his crimes have done to those who are still here. The people who lost their family, their close friends, or even their childhood innocence. I think it stayed with me probably for 40 of the 50 years, if you can believe that, just growing up. Hitting 21, gee, Pat would be 21. Getting married, gee, who would Pat have married? 
you know, you go to the movies, gee, would Pat have ever made it? What could she have become? You have the horror of losing someone you love in such a traumatic way. And then they're still afraid that the killer's out there. Here's Rhonda. After he he killed them all and left, I was always so scared he was going to come back and get me. Isn't that crazy? I always thought that. She said years later, even when she moved away, got married, and was raising her daughters, her fear of John List was still there. I asked her about living with that fear. What it was like was I put a bat next to my door. That's how afraid I was. I know a bat can't do much at times, but my husband at the time traveled a lot too, so I, at night then I'd, I'd carry it up to the bedroom and have it up there. That's how I felt. And you also have to figure, if you're one of the people who helped catch him, he's always going to be a part of your story, too. Yeah, the list murders are part of the legacies of the people who have died. I mean, there's too many to name, like Wanda Flannery and Frank Marenka, the captain who helped convince America's Most Wanted to take the case. Here's what Barney Tracy had to say about it. Well, you'd think of Frank Marenka, and I'm sure, like, at his wake surrounding his funeral. People were talking about John List, but he's part of Frank's legacy in a good way, I guess. Now, we're almost done here, but there's one last unsolved mystery that we haven't talked about yet. It's something that we thought was long settled until we dug into it in the final stages of our podcast. What the hell happened to John List's remains? Yeah, again, this is something everyone just thought was fact, but it turned out to be much murkier. For years, everyone had just repeated what was in a Star Ledger article four days after John List's death, that no one had yet claimed his body, and if no one did after a few months, he'd be cremated and interred in a state prison cemetery. And at first, it did look like that's what happened. The Department of Corrections wouldn't answer our question— but we got records that show List was cremated and his remains were picked up by a prison supervisor. So I went to this sad little corner of a cemetery outside Trenton where the unclaimed remains are buried under gravestones with their prisoner number. But I just walked around and around and I didn't find List's prisoner number. List wasn't buried there. And it was only after we approached the Department of Corrections with that information that they told us. Someone actually did claim List's remains the year he died. But the spokeswoman said she couldn't reveal who, for privacy reasons. She did confirm that the remains could only be given to next of kin or another person with a signed affidavit swearing they had the right to collect them. So who could have claimed them? We do know List has cousins still living in Michigan, and he corresponded with at least one of them when he was in prison. But the only one I reached hung up on me. I also checked with St. Lorenz Cemetery in Frankenmuth, Michigan, where Alma's buried, and they confirmed List's remains were never interred there. So I'm going to ask the obvious question here. Could it have been Dolores? I mean, it's possible, but we couldn't ask her. She doesn't want to talk to us. There's just a part of me that thinks Dolores would have wanted him to get a proper funeral. Even though he never deserved it, she really stood by him through a lot in the past. So would it be that surprising? I can see it, but we just can't know for sure if List was in contact with other relatives or someone else who wanted to see him laid to rest. So it's another question that's going to have to go unanswered. That there are mysteries still left is kind of amazing, right, Jess? I mean, this was never a traditional murder mystery. It was an open and shut case, not a whodunit. And yet, we'll never be able to explain it all. And that's another reason the case is so unsettling to this day. You just can't put a bow on it. But can you close the book on it? I mean, it has been 50 years, and time keeps marching on. The census shows most people who live in Westfield now were not even alive when List murdered his family. So maybe we're not far from when people will finally stop talking about John List. 
And I think there are many people who will be glad to close the book on John List. Just like people weren't sad to see the mansion burn and get demolished until there wasn't anything left. But there just may be no way around it. Some people will have to live with that little bit of fear or sadness or both. And that may never go away. So I want to end this podcast with Chris Day. When I first was trying to track him down, I wasn't sure I had found the right guy. But then I could tell by his tone, it was so somber, and I knew it was him. And I was honestly surprised he agreed to meet with me because it was clear he hadn't talked about this in years. All these months later, we're still in contact. He calls every once in a while to check in, ask how the podcast is going. He's retired, living in central Jersey, He and his wife will celebrate their 40th wedding anniversary this year. Our first sit-down interview happened last summer. We met in this park by the Delaware River in Trenton. And he told me for years he'd try to avoid talking to anyone from the Westfield area. He was afraid they'd mention the list killings and ask him about them. But in the months since we've talked, that's changed. He's reached out to some old friends He's no longer keeping it a secret from people. But it's still a source of pain. And if I'm being honest, I do feel bad because I think talking about it has brought a lot of that pain to the surface again. Because even though Chris knows his relationship with Patty never would have lasted, he still wishes it hadn't ended the way it did. But he hadn't hurt her that last day. Do you think that you've forgiven yourself? Are you still working on that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Usually I feel better when I don't think about it. I think the thing I want it, I always, I just want to like, just five minutes with that kid. I'd settle for three if it could happen and just look at her and hold her and, and look in her eyes and just say, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. After our first interviews, Chris went to Fairview Cemetery, where most of the lists are buried. He hadn't been there in years. He spent a morning standing in the hot sun, talking to Patty, paying his respects to the family. And maybe that's the closest he'll get to a little peace. Chris hopes having the truth out there, the full story, will help. I like to hope so, too. I think it'll provide some kind of forgiveness because I'm confessing how it really went because that may be... Kind of like maybe reconciliation, uh, a way to put it to rest. This has been Father Wants Us Dead, a podcast about the saga of John List murders and the years-long effort to bring him to justice. We want to hear from you. Send us your questions, your stories about the List family, or tell us how this case affected you. We may do a Q&A or get a few of you on for a bonus episode. You can reach us at inbox at fatherwantsusdead.com. For more about the story, including crime scene photos and other extras we couldn't fit into the show, visit fatherwantsusdead.com. Father Wants Us Dead is a production of NJ Advance Media. It's reported, written, and produced by us, Jessica Remo and Rebecca Everett. Christopher Kelly is our executive producer and director. Alyssa Pasagio and Kevin Whitmer are also executive producers. Father Wants Us Dead was recorded at Sound on Sound Studios in Montclair, New Jersey. Our sound designer, mixer, and editor is Jacob Stone. Jacob and Alex Ritchie composed the music. And Alex also helped mix the podcast. James Shapiro is our associate audio engineer with help from Natalie Patterson. Additional audio was provided by Adam Kolick and Andre Malock. 
Our website was designed by Allah Salim. Special thanks to all our sources who agreed to talk to us, even though we know it wasn't easy. Subscribe to Father Wants Us Dead wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're enjoying it, please rate and review it and help us spread the word.